we thought it would be worthwhile as we walk through this technology platform, because this is based on mass spectrometry, to start with kind of an introduction to biological mass spectrometry. Um, just a step or two back, um, this technology was developed over the last several years with funding from the FBI and from NIJ and uh, through IBIS Biosciences. IBIS is uh, a subsidiary now of Abbott Molecular. We were recently acquired by Abbott Molecular. And um, so this technology is something that we're very interested in getting into the hands of the users in this community. So what I'm going to do is start with kind of a high level overview of mass spectrometry. Uh, and this is my disclaimer. So this presentation covers the basic concepts of mass spectrometry. You don't need to know everything in this presentation to use this technology. But I think if you have a good underlying understanding of the principles behind the technology, it will help you apply it and understand how it can be applied. Um, as one uses this technology, you're not expected to be tweaking all the knobs and levers and things on the mass spectrometer to get it dialed in. Okay, it's a, it's a lockdown back end. Um, and really the goal of this is to kind of give you a basic understanding of how mass spectrometry works, kind of from the black box perspective. So when you're having cocktails tonight and somebody asks you, hey, what's the difference between electrospray ionization and matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization? You can just answer and maybe get a free drink out of them. So uh, big picture overview, what I'm going to cover here is first, you know, what is mass spectrometry from a very high level? Uh, many of us haven't talked about mass spectrometry since freshman chemistry, maybe, if, if even then. So I think a high level overview would be useful. I'll give you a brief history of mass spectrometry, where it started and how it was derived. Talk about some of the general components, um, definitions and nomenclature with respect to what is a mass spectrum. We'll talk briefly about some of the ways that we can form ions, uh, both MALDI and electrospray. And then most important for this application, the use of what's called a time of flight mass spectrometer and um, how we do electrospray ionization time of flight of nucleic acids. So big picture on this platform, and you're going to hear more about this in the next uh, couple of days. But what we do is we take DNA samples, they're amplified using polymerase chain reaction, and then instead of sequencing or instead of running them out of the gel or hybridizing on a DNA microarray, we analyze them in a mass spectrometer. And that's really what's important for this part of the lecture is how do we do that? What is a mass spectrometer? What information does it provide? As you'll see, what gets provided from the mass spectrometer is base compositions. So not the order of bases, but how many A's, G's, C's, and T's are in a given piece of DNA. Very important distinction. I'll make this point several times. There's a lot of information to be had from nucleic acids in just how many of each of the building blocks is present without considering the order. So that's really what I'm going to talk about here is what is this step? What is a mass spectrometer? How does it work? and how do we use it for our application. So one of the reasons that mass spectrometry is very appealing for these sorts of analyses is it's very high in information content. As I'll show you from a precise weight of a piece of DNA, just by accurately weighing it, we can derive unambiguously this base composition, how many A's, G's, C's, and T's are given in a single fragment of DNA. We can do so very rapidly. We're approaching now 30 seconds per sample, very rapidly, uh, very automated. Um, we can do so from mixtures. So we have a dynamic range of around 100 to 1 for the mass spectrometer. And I will show you examples, as will Dr. McCurdy later, where mass spectrometry succeeds where sequencing fails based on mixture, based on either base heteroplasmy or length heteroplasmy or an actual mixture, we can deconvolve those mixtures. Um, the system which you will be exposed to today and actually get to work on tomorrow is highly automated end-to-end -end from amplicon purification to mass spectrometry to data analysis. And the sensitivity is basically that of PCR. We're, 
limited on the front end as any other molecular approach which uses PCR. Typically, if there's enough there to amplify, there's enough there for the mass spectrometer to analyze. So it's like a big step back. Now, what is a mass spectrometer? You can think of this, it's an instrument which measures the mass to charge ratio of an ionized or charged analyte based on its response to applied electric and or magnetic fields. And with this tool, we can measure individual atoms, molecules, clusters, big non-covalent complexes. Think of this as a way we put a charge on a particle, like a static charge, and you can take a balloon and rub it on your head and it gets charged. That's a static charge. That's essentially all we're doing here. We're putting a static charge on a molecule of interest. In this case, the molecule of interest is a piece of DNA. And we're going to push it around in the gas phase with electric or magnetic fields. And based on how hard we push it and how it responds, we can actually derive a weight. So a mass spectrometer at a high level is just a very accurate molecular scale. Uh, the mass to charge measurement is converted to a mass measurement. Because we have to have a charge on the particle to measure it, what we're measuring exactly is the mass to charge of the molecule. We can convert that to a mass. Uh, mass is measured in atomic mass units. We also call those Daltons. So by definition, one Dalton or one atomic mass unit is one twelfth the mass of a single atom of carbon twelve. That is the definition of a mass unit. Atomic mass unit or Dalton is derived from carbon twelve. Uh, so an Avogadro's number of carbon atoms weighs twelve grams. Uh, one Dalton weighs this many grams. Uh, Z is an integer multiple of the fundamental unit of charge, which is in coulombs. And so uh, the mass of a molecule is the mass to charge times the charge. Okay? So um, again, this is a molecular scale. Uh, in this case, we're weighing fairly large molecules by mass spectrometry standards. The sorts of DNA fragments we're going to weigh are on the order of 30 to 45,000 Daltons typically 150 or so base pairs in a single amplicon. So way back in the late 1800s, um, Thompson really was the discoverer of mass spectrometry. He really invented mass spectrometry. Um, he understood, based on the presence of electrons, which he called corpuscles, that these were charged particles he built a beam deflection device, which basically sent a beam of electrons in a vacuum tube to a detector plate. And by biasing these two plates, he could steer this beam up and down. And so he reasoned that there must be charges on these particles. And uh, based on his brilliance and this device, he was able to actually measure the mass of an electron based on measuring its deflection by this device. So this was late uh, 1800s. He got the Nobel Prize in 1906. Uh, one of his students, um, Aston, used a mass spectrometer then on things other than electrons. He took gaseous elements. He was the one that realized that using different atomic gases gives um, different signatures. And he proved the existence of multiple isotopes meaning there's different flavors of the same sort of atom. You can have carbon-12, or you can have carbon-13, O16, O18, and so on. He didn't get it exactly right, because if you look closely here, you can probably see this in your handouts. But um, he had atomic mass units here. And then he had a couple places where we had you know, 40, 41, 41 and a half. Well, there's no half mass unit, but um, the principle was very sound. Uh, and this is really where the term mass spectroscopy was born. Uh, he used a film to detect these lines of molecules and atoms as they hit the film. And from the spacing of these, he was able to show multiple isotopes and get accurate atomic masses for these. So this was really, you know, this and the previous slide really speak to the genesis of mass spectrometry. So modern mass spectrometers, luckily we don't have to have glass blowers to make all these custom gadgets now. A modern mass spectrometer uh, is comprised of multiple systems 
we have an inlet system, which is uh, how we introduce our sample. This can be anything from a direct solid probe to a liquid being injected to the effluent from an HPLC. Uh, many of you likely do GCMS, where your GC is part of your inlet system. Um, once we get the sample into the mass spectrometer, we have to charge it. Again, a mass spectrometer weighs things based on electric fields pushing them around, and we can't push them around unless they're charged. So we have to ionize this. Uh, we have ion optics, which focus the charged particles down the mass spectrometer, make sure they hit the detector properly, make sure they're being measured properly. Um, we have an ion analyzer, which sorts these ions based on their mass to charge. So typically, lighter, smaller ions fly faster than larger, heavier ions, and that's a basis for separation. Uh, we have to detect these ions. So they have to hit some sort of surface which gives a response so we know that a charged particle has hit that surface. And there are several ways of doing this. Uh, we have to have a data system which takes this data, processes the data, and in the end uh, creates a mass spectrum. Okay, so we go from sample in, we ionize it, we sort it, we detect it, and then we do the data processing. So this is a typical mass spectrum. And I say, you know, with the quotes, because really this is, if you look at the bottom, this doesn't tell you mass, this tells you mass to charge. And basically a typical mass spectrum has on the x-axis uh, numbers corresponding to the mass to charge that we're measuring. And the y-axis, you'll see labeled many different things. Typically things like relative abundance, arbitrary intensity, uh, detector response, something like that. It's typically not counting individual atoms or molecules, so it's not a quantitative y-axis. It's relative to other things in the spectrum. So lots of these little peaks. Each of these peaks, though, uh, if we blow up, we can see that it has a very precise measurement. So this peak has a mass, has an M over Z of 397.1104 Daltons, a peak right next to it has a slightly different uh, molecular weight, and these show the elemental uh, compositions of these two peaks. So importantly, you can have two species that have very similar masses, but very different elemental compositions. And this is really important when you're looking at drug metabolites or toxins and things like that, where just saying you have a peak at mass 397 doesn't necessarily tell you what you've got. You need to have accurate mass measurements to derive an elemental composition. So this is a typical mass spectrum. Um, as we look at larger molecules, which is really of interest for this platform, things get a little more complicated. We have to consider the isotopic envelope. We have to consider that most elements have more than one isotope. So if we're going to have a large molecule that has many, many copies of a single sort of atom, odds are we're going to have a collection of isotopes. If we take a bunch of carbon atoms, we're going to usually get carbon atoms that weigh 12 mass units. But about one out of 100 times, we'll get a heavy carbon that will weigh 13 mass units. So this can um, create what's called an isotopic envelope. Uh, a typical carbon-12 atom is made of six neutrons, six protons, six electrons. But occasionally, you get one that's got an extra neutron. It weighs 13 mass units. So um, different elements have different ratios, different sorts of mixtures. Uh, fluorine, for example, is only uh, monoisotopic, only fluorine 19. All fluorine atoms, by definition, weigh 19. Uh, chlorine is kind of a mess. Chlorine, uh, three out of four chlorines weigh 35, and one out of four weighs 37 mass units. So if you have a lot of chlorine atoms in a molecule, you have a lot of different masses, a lot of different peaks in your isotopic distribution. So we have to account for this in how we measure things because we have to know the width of this distribution, when it's a factor and when it's not. So unless a molecule is composed of only monoisotopic elements, that would be, for example, all carbon-12s, all oxygen-16s, and so on, there's a finite probability that it will contain one or more heavy isotopes. The relative abundance of the monoisotopic peak 
decreases with increasing mass, and I'll show you some examples of this. Um, and except in a few cases, um, isotopic fine structure cannot be resolved. So that means there are cases where um, isotopic species differ by fractions of a Dalton, and you typically don't resolve those. So let's look just at carbon, just to kind of simplify this. If we have a mass spectrum of a carbon atom, it would look like this, where typically it weighs 12 mass units, but once in a while we happen to reach into our bag of carbon atoms and pull out a heavy one that weighs 13. Now, if we're just looking at a molecule that's got one carbon atom in it, this is what we'd see, this kind of distribution. If we take a molecule that has 100 carbon atoms in it, well then statistically speaking, we're usually going to have at least one copy of a heavy carbon in that molecule. So we're going to have a distribution here. Usually we'll have one heavy carbon. Sometimes we have none, but also sometimes we can have two or three or four or five. Now the sorts of molecules we're looking at that weigh 30 to 45 kilodaltons, they're going to have a lot of carbon atoms in it. So we're going to actually have a distribution of masses dependent on how many heavy carbons we create or we uh, measure. So we have what's called an isotope distribution, where we have a statistical distribution around this median here of um, heavy and light carbon atoms. So when we measure this, we measure something that weighs, in this case, that has a thousand carbon atoms, we're going to get a range of masses, all of which correspond to the same molecule, but are derived from different compositions of heavy and light atoms. So. Um, a little bit on metrics, how we measure mass, uh, the nomenclature that we use. You'll hear often people talking about resolution or resolving power or mass resolving power. This is actually, in a raw spectrum, it's the width of the peak divided by the placement of the peak. Okay, so for this example, it's typically spec'd as full width half maximum. And I should point out that any abbreviations that are in this presentation, at the very last slide, there's a list of all the abbreviations. So in this case, our resolution, we measure a width of 1.2 m over z units, and it's at a position of m over z 1205, so the resolution of this measurement is about 1,000. Okay. Now, if we make this measurement on a very high resolution mass spectrometer, uh, notice at this resolution there's no isotopic envelope. It's just a, a distribution of isotopes. Were we to make this at a high resolution measurement, we would see the individual isotopic species. So this is a monoisotopic 1 carbon 12, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So in this case, our resolution, our peak width at half max is 0.12 m over z units. It's at a position of 1205.24. So here the resolution is a little, little over 10,000. In order to resolve the isotopic structure, you need to have resolution that exceeds the molecular weight of what you're measuring. Okay, so at uh, resolution of 10,000, here we can easily resolve these isotopic uh, constituents. Uh, if we had resolution of 10,000, and we're measuring something that weighs 30 or 40,000 mass units, we would just get this nice smooth distribution. Okay. So there are other ways of um, defining mass. Uh, for low molecular weight species, it's quite common. So there's no confusion about which isotope you're talking about. You can define the monoisotopic molecular weight. This is the mass of all light atoms in a species. So this has all carbon 12s, all nitrogen 14s, oxygen 16s, and so on. All the lightest element within that series. Um, so this is quite common for low molecular weight species. Um, for the work that we're doing here, this is what we use, average molecular weight. Because we're not going to get this isotopic resolution on every DNA peak that we're measuring, we measure the average molecular weight, which is basically the centroid of this peak which defines the isotopic distribution. For uh, very large molecules at very high resolution, uh, 
The other approach that's not that common but is used sometimes is the mo molecular weight of the most abundant isotope. So here you would look at this distribution and say, well, the tallest peak I have has, you know, a given molecular weight. The problem with this is you have to have very good statistics behind this measurement because the difference between the height of this peak and the height of the peak next to it might differ by only a few percent. And so if you use most abundant isotope, you can be off by a full mass unit. Okay, so um, you'll hear us refer to mass measurement accuracy. This is basically how closely the measurement that we make correlates with the known atomic or molecular weight. We s typically specify this in parts per million. And it's basically the mass measurement error over, you know, it's uh, what, you, what you know or expect the mass to be minus what you measure divided by what you know or expect it to be. Okay, so we typically define this in parts per million because these are typically very, very small mass differences. Uh, for example, the peaks I showed you earlier here at uh, very high resolution accurate mass uh, with these standards, we know their elemental composition. We can calculate what the mass should be. We measure this. That's a, uh, the delta mass is 0 .0001 daltons. That's 0.25 ppm. And the reason we use parts per million is, uh, you know, this, if, if this was a large number, this delta mass was a large number, if it was, say, four mass units, we'd use percent. We'd be off by 1%, right? Four, four mass units out of 400 would be 1%. So you can think of this as that would be 1% or 1 per 100, 1 per 1,000, 1 per 10,000, 1 per 100,000, 1 per million. So we're looking out here in this example at the fourth decimal place, when we're doing mass measurements of these large PCR products, we're typically in the 10 parts per million mass measurement regime. So we're not looking out here at the fourth decimal place, but out here at the second or third. Okay, a little bit about the nuts and bolts of a mass spectrometer. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, ionization sources and mass analyzers, and I'm going to focus on the, ma on the ionization sources that are relevant to large molecules. There's a bunch of different ways to ionize small molecules. I'm going to touch on a couple of those, but I want to make sure that we all have a good understanding in here of what is electrospray and what is MALDI and the differences between those, because a common misconception is people assume that when you're doing time of flight mass spectrometry, that means you've got a laser and you're doing MALDI time of flight. And that's not the case. They're separate. So in your mind, separate how we make ions from how we measure ions. So all an ionization source does is it charges. It puts a static charge on a molecule. And there's a couple of ways of doing this. We can either add or remove electrons, which are negatively charged. So if we add electrons to it, our molecule becomes a negatively charged ion. Uh, we can also knock electrons off, and it becomes positively charged. Uh, for electrospray, we can add or remove protons. So this does result in a slight change of the mass because a proton weighs about one. And if we add protons, we put positive charges on. If we remove protons, we uh, invoke negative charges. Uh, there's several efficient methods for ionizing low molecular weight or volatile compounds that probably many of you have used looking at uh, GCMS sorts of applications, looking at gunshot residue and explosives and so on. Uh, and until recently, and until really the 80s, uh, it was difficult to, to ionize molecules greater than about 1,000 Daltons. It was a heroic effort if you could get a spectrum of a molecule that weighed a couple of thousand Daltons because the sorts of methods that I'll describe briefly here are pretty harsh, and while they're adding electrons or knocking off electrons, they can also break covalent bonds and cause fragmentation. So um, two sorts of techniques like that, that I'm just going to touch on briefly, uh, which you may have heard of, atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. This is a way of forming ions by ionizing a gas that's very easy to ionize, and then having that ionized gas interact with your analyte and you get charge transfer from that. And it's fairly gentle. You can actually um, see in this illustration we have a, a filament which emits electrons across this path. We've got uh, 
high abundance of our um, carrier gas here, which is ionized. And then when that charged gas interacts with our volatile small molecule, it causes a charge transfer and it gets charged. Uh, the other method is that of electron ionization, where our molecular ions are directly impacted with an electron beam. And they either capture electrons and get negatively charged, or the electron beam can actually knock an electron out of the electron orbitals, and it can get positively charged. Again, this can be pretty harsh, and this is not amenable to large molecules like DNA or proteins, because you can't get large molecules in the gas phase just floating around. And if they're hit with high energy electrons, they often fragment along the backbone. So for large molecules, there's really two choices now for making fairly gentle ways um, of intact molecular ions. The first is MALDI, or matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization. Okay? And the way this works is you take your sample. It could be a protein or DNA or peptides or whole cell lysate. You mix it with a matrix, uh, typically an organic acid, which absorbs photons at a given wavelength. Uh, you have this co-crystallized matrix here, and you blast it with a laser. And by blasting it with a laser, you uh, make your crystals absorb this energy. They get charged. They transfer charge to large uh, neutral molecules. And the neutral molecules then leave with one or two charges, typically. They might pick up a proton or maybe two, but typically no more than that. Um, this is a pulsed ionization source, so you fire the laser and you get a pulse of ions off the surface. So that's why you often hear maldi toff because it's very well suited for time of flight. Time of flight, you need a good starting point, and firing that laser, you know exactly when your ions were formed, and you push them, and you've got a good start and stop uh, scenario. Um, it's relatively salt tolerant, which is one of the advantages that MALDI has over electrospray. As you'll see, one of the key attributes of this technology we're going to talk about, and one of the challenges was how do we get a salty PCR-derived DNA amplicon free of all salt, all sodiums and potassiums, such that we can electrospray it. MALDI, the advantage is it's not quite so so worried about uh, salt, it's much more tolerant. It is effective also for a wide range of molecular weights. Uh, very fast, uh, you can do MALDI uh, multiple times a second. So you can really go through a lot of samples. It's not as gentle as electrospray. So you really struggle with taking a piece of DNA that weighs 45,000 Daltons and trying to promote it with this, this pretty violent laser pulse trying to promote this into the gas phase without breaking your DNA. You'll see this used a lot in DNA for short pieces of DNA, you know, 20 mers and 30 mers, where you're asking a, a SNP sort of question or a primer extension sort of question. It's very well suited for that. But for large DNA molecules, for very labile complexes, or for non-covalent complexes, um, this is not the preferred method and electrospray is. So let's talk about electrospray. In electrospray, you start with your sample in solution. And you basically set up a spray here by applying a large electro potential difference between the end of the capillary and the inlet to your mass spectrometer. So what you end up with is a spray of an aerosol plume of highly charged droplets. Okay, so these droplets are highly charged. They contain one or more molecules of your analyte. And as these droplets start to evaporate, they shrink. And as they shrink, the charge um, density on the surface gets higher and higher because the total charge remains the same. So these droplets shrink. They get more and more and more charged. Finally, the charge density of the droplet exceeds the surface tension holding it together, and it explodes. So the droplet explodes, it makes another smaller droplet, which then it shrinks and explodes and shrinks and explodes. This happens multiple times, and at the end, what you end up with is your biomolecule of interest, 
that's very highly charged. It's been in a tiny droplet that's got a ton of charge in it. And finally, this molecule desorbs from the droplet, and you end up in the gas phase now with a desolvated, naked, highly charged ion. Okay? So that's actually good, because if we have a molecule that weighs 10,000, and we put 10 charges on it, we're going to measure it at a mass to charge of 1,000. And that's an area where mass spectrometers work very well. The other disadvantage of MALDI, it putting only one or two charges on it, is you have to have a huge M over Z range over which you're making measurements. With electrospray, pretty much everything folds over into the same M over Z range. So you don't have to know ahead of time if you're looking for a really small molecule or a huge molecule because you're going to detect it in the same M over Z range no matter what. This is an extremely soft ionization technique. It's applicable to labile molecules such as DNA and non-covalent complexes. We did a bunch of work back in our drug discovery days using this ionization technique to screen for drugs by taking uh, a nucleic acid target of interest and a small molecule and asking the question, does this small molecule bind in solution to this RNA target? And by electrospraying the intact non-covalent complex, we could actually look for mass shifts from these non-covalent complexes. Um, on the downside, it has an extremely low tolerance for non-volatile salts and buffer additives and detergents. So things that you need to make PCR work, such as salts and detergents and polymers, make electrospray not work. So, a big step involved in this whole process is automating that cleanup from crude PCR product to something you can put in your mass spectrometer. It's extremely sensitive, um, applicable to analyte concentrations, you know, down below even a nanomolar. Okay, so let's look at some mass spectra now. Um, this is a very simple mass spectrum of a, a singly charged molecule. So we have one peak here. This is in a negative ionization mode, so we know this is an M minus a proton. It's got one charge on it, so this is typical nomenclature. Molecular ion plus or minus protons, and this signifies the charge. So this is a singly charged molecule. Um, to get the molecular weight, we take the mass to charge that we've measured. Here we're going to add back the mass of a proton to get a neutral mass, so this peak tells us that this molecule weighs 1,348 Daltons, okay? So this is an easy case. You've got a single charge. M over Z is about the same as M. Pretty straightforward. What about something like this? This is a large protein, okay? So you look at this, and you can't just glance at it and say, oh, that protein weighs 28,821 Daltons. So you look first at, this, at the spectrum, and you say, well, what, what do we know? We do know the mass to charge of a lot of peaks because each of these peaks, we can look down on our x-axis and get an exact m over z, so that's useful. We do know that each of these peaks differs by one charge state. One of the things that happens in electrospray is sometimes a large molecule would pick up 10 protons or 11 or 12 or 13, but we know that those differ by one charge. There's no such thing as a half a charge. So we know that these adjacent peaks differ by one charge state. Just looking at this, we don't know the molecular weight, we don't know which charge states correspond to which peaks, and we don't know what all these peaks are. But it's actually pretty simple to decode this. Very simple equation. The, uh, to get the charge state of one of these peaks, you basically take the mass to charge of a peak and divide it by the difference between two adjacent peaks. So for example, if we look at these two peaks and we say, let's find the charge state of this guy, we can take this peak, divide by the difference in M over Z's of these, that will give us the charge state for this peak. Okay? So the charge state for this peak here is 30. 994 divided by this difference, which is about 33, gives us 30. So now the whole puzzle unwinds. Now we know the M over Z of all of these peaks, we know the charge state of this peak, and therefore we know the charge state of all of the peaks. 
we know these differ by one charge state. So if this is 30, this must be 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, and so on. Okay, so now, now it all unwinds. And by averaging these derived molecular weights over each of these peaks, we can get a very precise mass measurement. That's another advantage of electrospray. While this information might seem redundant at first, it's actually confirmatory because we're making here, what, about 15 measurements of the same molecular ion measured at different charge states. So here we can take this, the uh, M over Z we measured times its charge state. We're going to take the number of protons off of the mass and we get 28,821 mass units. So I should point out that this sort of, of uh, deconvolution is automated. You don't have to, every time a mass spectrum comes up, pull out your calculator and, and figure out the mass, thank God. Um, this is all automated, and we're going to hear a lot later today about the software that we have in place, um, of how this works for nucleic acids. So again, a lot of these kind of nitty-gritty details I'm going through are kind of the under-the-hood sorts of things that as you use this technology, you're not going to be deconvolving mass spectra or deciding if something's positive or negatively charged. Uh, let's talk about electrospray ionization of DNA. Now, as you all know, DNA has a phosphodiester backbone, which is easily deprotonated at high pH. So this is a very simple way of putting static charges on DNA molecules, is uh, raising the pH enough that the proton dissociates from this phosphodiester group here. So we run um, all the DNA molecules in the negative ionization mode because it's very straightforward to ionize the backbone by imparting negative charges. Um, and we've done a lot of optimization over the years, starting with our drug discovery days even, for optimizing the solution and interface conditions to allow us to uh, ionize and desolvate and measure intact nucleic acids. So here's kind of a snapshot of where things were, you know, 20 some odd years ago. I mentioned that it used to be a heroic achievement to ionize a molecule over 1,000 Daltons. This is an example from a paper uh, from 1981 where uh, McNeil and, and uh, McCarlin ionized a 6 kilodalton piece of synthetic DNA. This was before MALDI, this was before electrospray. They had a radioactive source, Californium-252, which is very environmentally unfriendly, and we don't use it anymore. Um, but they were still able to get this large molecule into the gas phase and measure it. Um, the resolution was about 25. We would laugh at that now. Mass accuracy of almost 1,000 parts per million. This is plus or minus 5 Daltons. In its day, though, this was a heroic achievement, and it's incredible that um, this was accomplished back then with this sort of ionization source. Nowadays, fast forwarding, this is a measurement taken in my laboratory several years ago, actually, on a high-resolution FTICR mass spectrometer. Uh, this was 120 mer DNA, weighed about 37 kilodaltons, resolving power of 150,000, mass accuracy of one part per million. So while they were measuring plus or minus 5 mass units out of 6,000, we're measuring plus or minus 0.04 out of 37 kilodons. So it's really come a long way. And what you'll see as we go forward is that this sort of extremely high resolution, high mass measurement accuracy is really overkill for these forensics applications where all we need is a base composition. Okay, so keep that in mind that we're not going to use a very high and expensive FTICR mass spectrometer. We're going to use a benchtop, straightforward time of flight mass spectrometer. So this is what a mass spectrum, an electrospray mass spectrum of a PCR product looks like. You'll recognize the distribution of charge states. Okay, so some, some molecules get 25 charges, some get 26, and so on. Typical distribution. What's different about this than the protein spectrum I just showed you is you'll notice that each charge state is represented by doublets. And the reason is, this is of a double-stranded PCR product, and we've used appropriate solution or interface conditions to gently peel apart the duplex in the gas phase. Uh, 
So we're measuring independently forward strand mass and reverse strand mass. Turns out that's really important for getting these base compositions. So this is a typical electrospray spectrum of a PCR product of a single PCR product. Uh, we do a lot of multiplexing, and you'll hear later about the mitochondrial assay and the STR assays. They're typically multiplexed, so we do multiple PCR reactions at once, and we spray that all together. Um, so this is more of a congested-looking spectrum where you can't necessarily look at this and recognize the doublets and the nice, clean chart state distributions. Um, but remember, we have this mathematical deconvolution we can do that takes us from the mass to charge to the mass domain. Uh, we always have internal mass calibrants. This is very important. Uh, we add to each reaction at the very end a low mass and a high mass peptide. We know the exact molecular weight of that peptide. We know the exact molecular weight of multiple isotopes of that peptide. So after we acquire spectrum, automatically we ask the mass spectrometer, you know, what do you think this weighs? And if it's not exactly right on, then we adjust the x-axis until the peptides here and the peptides here are right on the money. And that means the species in between will be exactly calibrated as well. So we can take this raw spectrum. We can deconvolve it now into a uh, mass, a true mass spectrum in Dalton's or in atomic mass units. We can see that this was from a triplex PCR reaction. So we get forward and reverse strands of this amplicon, this amplicon, and this amplicon. And then we're going to convert this to a base composition. And the analogy I like to use is that of coins in a scale. So if I tell you how much a penny, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter weigh, and I give you a standard lab scale, I could give you one or two or maybe three, maybe four coins and tell you Without looking at the coins, look just at the scale and at your lookup table here, how many coins have I given you and of what type? Okay, so if I give you one coin, that's like falling off a log, right? I could give you a, a 2.5 grams worth of change, and you'd look at the list and say, well, 2.5 grams, got to be a penny. Okay, and if I give you 4.6 grams, you'd look at this and say, well, it's not enough for a quarter. Uh, two pennies would weigh too much. Oh, there, two dimes. Perfect. Now it gets more and more complex as I give you three and four and five coins. Now imagine I give you 150 coins or 200 coins. Okay, you got to have a really good scale, lots of decimal places, very high precision. You're going to need more than a scratch pad to do the math. Okay, but that's essentially what we're doing down here. We've got four building blocks, the four DNA bases. We know exactly how much each of those four bases weighs. We know how much A, G, C, and T weigh. We have an excellent scale that does have lots of decimal places and is exquisitely precise. And importantly, we've got Watson-Crick base pairing on our side. So keep in mind that we're measuring independently the forward and the reverse strand of these PCR products. We know based on how PCR works that those are Watson-Crick base paired so we know the number of A's in one strand must equal the number of T's in the complementary strand. Same with G and C. So this greatly simplifies the math and allows us to make uh, base composition assignments with modest mass measurement error. As long as we're about 25 ppm or better and we use Watson-Crick, we can get an unambiguous base composition. Now if we didn't have that, we'd be out of luck. So Let's consider these single strand masses. This is uh, the pair I just showed you that weighs about 33 kilodaltons. If we took just a single stranded mass and we looked at this light strand at 25 part per million mass measurement error using only the one strand, there'd be almost a thousand base compositions consistent with this mass measurement plus or minus this uncertainty. Even at one part per million, 0.03 mass units, there'd be 82 compositions consistent with the mass and the uncertainty. Okay, so this would break. If we didn't have Watson-Crick base pairing on our side, we could not get an unambiguous base composition. Uh, same with the other strand. It's comparable. About 1,000 at 25 and about 1 ppm gives about 100. But if we look at the part per million mass measurement error 
and the number of complementary pairs that are consistent with that, you can see kind of a breaking point at 25. If we have 25 ppm or better, there's one unique base composition which satisfies the forward and reverse mass and the fact that these are complementary. Okay, so that, that's, that's a critical point. Um, and there's also a little trick that we use. If you look carefully at, at the illustration here, you'll notice that my nickel is a Canadian nickel. And the reason isn't that I couldn't find a U.S. nickel picture. Uh, it actually works out that uh, this coins and scale analogy breaks if you use U.S. coins in the proper masses. A U.S. nickel weighs five grams. So five grams worth of change could be two pennies or it could be one nickel. Now there's an interesting parallel between this coins analogy and DNA. If you look at the masses of the DNA, while they're not going to be confused one at a time, what if we have a SNP present? What if we have um, a mass measurement uncertainty, and we know there's a SNP present, but the mass measurement says, well, this, the shift in mass is 15 plus or minus 1. Well, that could be an A to a G, because an A to a G is 16 Daltons, or it could be a C to a T, that's 15 Daltons. We couldn't tell those apart. Okay? Now, what if we have both present? What if there's an A to a G and a C to a T? It's plus 16 minus 15. The net result is one mass unit. So within a mass measurement uncertainty, uh, that could be consistent with either wild type base composition or a double SNP mutant. Okay? So what we do is we use a Canadian nickel in these assays. You'll notice we've changed the mass of G here by 10 we incorporate in the PCR reaction um, a C13 labeled guanosine. So every time a G is incorporated, it shifts the mass by 10 Daltons relative to a native G. Okay? This solves a lot of problems. There's no confusion over which SNP is present. You're not asking is it a 16 Dalton shift or a 15. You're asking is it a 15 or is it a 26. Very straightforward. If you have the possibility of this double SNP, which in normal space would be one Dalton, now it's 10 Dalton. So there's no uncertainty there. You know if you've got wild type or this double SNP mutant. So if we look at some data, here's an example of two amplicons that differ by this double SNP, and we're using our US nickel here, our normal G DNTP. You'll notice we've got an A to a G and a T to a C, this relative to this. Uh, these differ by one Dalton. Okay, these, these could be confused, particularly when you've got low signal to noise and you've got some chemical noise and clutter. These could be confused. If we use our Canadian nickel, um, we're looking at a 10 Dalton difference between the strands, not a one Dalton difference, and it's obvious that you've got that double snip. Okay. So uh, again, we've got base compositions for our, our three uh, amplicons here, derived, in this case, using our Canadian nickel. All the data you're going to see with the mitochondrial and STR assays, uh, we use this Canadian nickel. Uh, we do have size constraints, though. I should point out that we generally want to characterize PCR products around 150 base pairs or less. And that's not always possible. Obviously, some of the larger STRs get larger than that. Uh, you'll see data later today and tomorrow. We can certainly see those. It gets more and more difficult to assign a de novo base composition for these really large molecules. Um, we try to stick with, as far as the way the assay is designed, we try to stick with about 150 base pairs. And if we can get 25 parts per million mass measurement error, we're in good shape. Uh, we, I'll show you a spectrum in a minute of larger products. It certainly is feasible. The information content is lower because, again, all these peaks fold over into the same mass to charge regime, so it's much more congested, and the math is not in our favor. Okay, so here's an example of a 299 base pair PCR product. And you can see it's getting a lot of peaks in there. This is still just one amplicon. Um, 
uh, charge states, you know, this, this has over 100 charges on it up here. This is 100, this is molecular ion minus 100 protons, which is minus 100 charge state. Uh, but if we take this and we deconvolve it, we still do pretty well here. Uh, we get um, average molecular weights that differ by around 10 parts per million from the theory. That's not bad. This is the best example, of course. If we average this over multiple measurements, so we do 24 replicates, on average we get about 20 parts per million for a really large amplicon. If you look at the number of base compositions now consistent with these masses, uh, going back again to just, if we had just a single strand, there's too many to calculate at 20. There's thousands. Even if we could get five parts per million for this 91 kilodalton molecule, there'd be over 12,000 base compositions consistent with this mass plus or minus five parts per million. Um, if we could get a double strand using forward and reverse masses, even at five parts per million, it's not unambiguous. Five parts per million, there's three possibilities. So you can see for really large things, the math kind of starts to break down. We would have to have exquisite one part per million mass measurement error on a 90 kilodalton molecule forward and reverse strand. So um, we can certainly ionize these larger species. We can get accurate mass measurements. The math does break down as far as doing a de novo base composition. If these are things like STRs, and we're just going to ask a question, does this have 12 repeats or 13 repeats, this is plenty. If we want to ask the question, is this mass consistent with the wild type sequence or the presence of a SNP, we can still tell there's a SNP present with this. We wouldn't use this for a de novo, you know, knowing nothing about the amplicon, what's the base composition though. Uh, a little bit about electrospray ionization parameters. It's important once we have these particles charged that we desolvate them or get all the water molecules off of them. If we don't, we're going to have adducts on the molecular ions, and that's going to give us lower sensitivity. So we can control this by how hot the desolvation gas is, the uh, pressure in the interface region, and the potential difference between different lens elements. Um, we can use this to be very gentle, and we have to be careful not to break the DNA. We don't want to knock off bases or break the backbone. So. Um, the same mass spectrometer can be tuned for kind of normal operation. Here we're looking at uh, PCR products from E. coli. You can see the double-stranded products. But by dialing down the heat using different source conditions, we can see actually the intact duplex in the gas phase. We don't use intact duplex because the mathematics are much less helpful there. You have the mass of a duplex. You can't use Watson Crick anymore. We can control uh, some of the electrostatic potentials to either be very gentle and get intact DNA molecules, or we can shred it. So this is a way you can actually do sequencing of short oligomers by making the interface so harsh that you break along the backbone, and by weighing those pieces, you can do DNA sequencing. Uh, salt is a killer. So a lot of work has gone into deriving a fully automated method of taking all the salt and other additives out of the crude PCR product before going into the mass spectrometer. Uh, high concentrations can preclude the generation of an electrospray plume altogether. It's just the solution's too conductive, it won't even spray. Um, you'll also see adducts where salt ions uh, stick to the backbone and cause adduct peaks which limit the overall sensitivity. Uh, and here's, here's an example of that and why salt is so bad. Um, here's a clean 20 mer oligonucleotide. You can see nice, clean, multiple charge states, a nice, clean molecular ion signal here. In the presence of salt, though, you see a lot of chemical noise, and you see each molecular ion peak has, um, you know, plus one, two, three, four, five, six, and more sodium adducts. So importantly, the overall sensitivity is reduced substantially because what is one peak here is now spread into a half a dozen or more peaks here that differ by the sodiation state. So we don't want to be looking at data like this. Tom's written some very nice software, which you'll hear about later, which actually looks for this and makes sure there hasn't been a problem with the desalting 
and if there is, it, it, it flags it. Um, here's an example of that. Here's a nice clean mass spectrum without salt adducts. If salt adducts are present, we look for them and they're labeled and it'll alert the user that, hey, you got salty peaks, you might want to check your cleanup reagents, maybe you didn't change buffers or so on. So mass analyzers, all mass analyzers work by measuring the response of charged particles to electric and or magnetic fields. Okay, so we've got these charged particles, we're going to push them around, in this case, with electrostatic fields, and we're going to measure how fast they fly or how far they fly or how much they're deflected, and from that, back calculate how much they weigh. Um, all of these have to work at reduced pressure because if we're pushing around ions at atmospheric pressure, they're going to get neutralized and they're going to get kind of drug through a viscous medium of, of atmosphere. So we work at low pressure. The time of flight analyzer works at about 10 to the minus 6 tor. Uh, other ones have to work at much, much lower pressure. Um, highlights of TOF. Um, it is a very simple and rugged benchtop instrument. It has a theoretically unlimited mass range because all we're doing is you can think of a TOF as a high-end stopwatch. We start our stopwatch and we push the ions at the same time. We let them fly for some length of time. When they hit the detector, we stop our stopwatch. We know how hard we pushed them. We know how far they flew. And we know how long it took them to fly that distance. So from that, we can calculate their mass. Um, disadvantages are that it doesn't have the exquisitely high resolution of some of the other mass spec platforms. Uh, it is an inherently pulsed technique. That's why you see it coupled with MALDI quite a bit. Fire the laser, that's your start pulse. Ions hit the end, that's your stop pulse. Very straightforward. Um, uh, and you can't simultaneously measure all MO over Z values. So that means if you, if you start your stop, you start your pulse, as your ions are flying, you can't wait for an infinite M over Z that might take 10 minutes to get there, right? So at some point, you got to just cut it off and say, we're going to look for things between M over Z 1 and 10,000. Um, once these hit the endpoint, they have to reach a detector, and they have to be detected. So there's several ways of doing this. Typically, they impinge on an electron multiplier or on a, mul on a microchannel plate. Basically, one ion hits causes a cascade of electrons or a cascade of charge, which is measured out here. So the example shown here, you get one ion hitting this detector. It causes a cascade of electrons, and out the back come a million or higher number of charges, which is easily detected on a solid state circuit. Uh, here's a typical mass spectrometer, uh, a time of flight, with a linear geometry. This uh, defines what I mentioned before with the MALDI. You fire the pulse, you get a pulse of ions. They fly just straight through some ion optics to focus them. The lighter ions travel faster than the heavier ones. They hit this detector. Uh, these are measured through an electron multiplier. And the data station then is basically looking at each time how many charges are hitting the detector. And you derive your mass spectrum that way. Uh, most time of flight mass spectrometers now use an ion mirror called a reflectron. And this gives you some energy focusing. So imagine you're about to, to push the ions, and you're going to push them all towards a detector. Some of the ions are already traveling that way, and some randomly are traveling towards you. Okay? So when you push them, they don't all quite get the same push. And so what this does is this allows you to do some energy focusing and make sure that at the end of this flight, ions with different initial velocities hit the detector at the same time. So the analogy here is that of um, rolling balls up a hill. If you take two balls and you will roll one just lightly and one heavily, the one that you push harder will go up the hill higher, but when it comes down, it's going to be going faster. And so you can find a point at which those two balls will coincide on, on a detector plane. That's all we're doing here. We're pushing balls up this hill. Uh, faster moving ones penetrate deeper. They have a longer flight path. And by adjusting these potentials, or the steepness of our hill, we can um, make sure that they hit in the same focal plane. Uh, now, I mentioned that MALDI is a pulsed source. Electrospray is not. It's a continuous source. And the way we get around this is we accumulate ions externally using one of the um, uh, RF hexapoles. And we can then 
pulse ions out when we're ready to detect them. So we got a continuous stream of ions going in here, and uh, at the time interval at which we want to detect mass spectra, we just gate these ions out and let them go flying and start our mass spectrum. So um, the goal here was not to make you all mass spec gurus and PhD analytical chemists in mass spectrometry. But going forward, I want you to understand the basic principles of the sorts of mass spectrometry that we're using for this technology. Okay, so just kind of reviewing here, mass spectrometer is just a scale. We're just weighing pieces of DNA. We do it by charging them up and pushing them around and measuring their response. Uh, we use electrospray ionization. Again, keep separate in your minds ways of making ions like electrospray or MALDI or electron impact from ways of measuring ions like time of flight, quadrupole ion traps, linear quadrupoles, and so on. Uh, we use electrospray because it can promote large, intact oligonucleotides very gently without knocking off bases, without causing backbone cleavages. Um, we use time of flight mass spectrometry because it provides accurate molecular weights and it's a very robust platform. Uh, as part of the IBIS process, we take amplified DNA, we weigh it, and we convert that to base composition. Remember that coins and scale analogy. And what we're going to use both in the mitochondrial assay and in STR assays is this base composition metric. We're not doing sequencing, we're not doing length measurements, we're weighing to get base composition, and that's our metric, okay? So um, this is in your handouts, your meta handouts, I guess. Um, any abbreviation that was in this presentation is listed here, so you can go back later and decode this. <laughs> 